All right, so common measurements, uh, chapter one, not chapter zero. So if you read that, it's cool because like that's history stuff. But if you didn't read chapter one, that's also all right. It's really more of, I was talking to a few of y'all up here, it's really more of a reference chapter. Um, so probably the most math that I'm going to talk about throughout the duration of the semester. And that's why it's first to get the crappy stuff out of the way right now. But looking ahead at what we're doing, I don't want that to be right there. Let's make that go away. But, uh... Okay, went away, perfect, okay. So for lab tomorrow, how it's gonna go, whichever lab you're in, I'm going to assign you into groups and that's gonna be the first thing that we do in there. If you could, on Canvas, I linked to an assortment of YouTube videos kind of explaining what we're going to be doing. So I go over the Word document a little bit and there's like a playlist of how to like make different graphs in Excel and how to do different things in Excel. Now, certainly you don't have to watch those if you completely understand how to do all of that stuff. I really just wanted to give it to you like right now so that you have something to reference if you don't know how to make like a bar graph or if you don't know how to ca calculate like a mean or standard deviation in Excel. Because in lab, we're going to be doing a fair bit of math and um, really it's not a crazy amount of math. It's mostly gonna be formulas within Excel. Um, so you really won't have to do too, too much. Um, but I, I will want you to watch those beforehand so that whenever we get there, I can just talk a little bit about the lab, then your group can just get to it, you can get in and out and ask questions with all of that. So if you've had me before, it's gonna be very similar to health appraisal. If you haven't had me before, I'll try to hold your hand a little bit more throughout it. So uh, that's how that's gonna go. Bring laptop, mostly be messing with Excel. And whatever I don't finish in this lecture today, we might talk about it a little bit, or at least the most relevant parts in terms of completing the lab. Just coming up, today, the 27th, common measurements, that's what we're doing. Uh, lab one, tomorrow, graphing, work, power, and metabolic equations. Then on Wednesday, uh, like, Exercise Evolution and Genetics Part 1. We're going to carry that over onto next Monday. And there are a couple of things for you to read. They, they're PDF files in Canvas, so just check those out. Does everyone get that? Like that's kind of the breakdown for what's coming up soon. So the objectives for this lecture, really, I want you to get more comfortable with like metric units and some various equations that we use a lot in exercise physiology. And kind of how to do like, Calculations with if someone's stepping on a box, if they're on a cycle ergometer, if you don't know what ergometer means, I'm gonna define that for you soon. How to calculate uh, <coughs> the amount of work on a treadmill. And then kind of at the end, some concepts with direct and indirect calorimetry, which we actually just got a new piece of equipment that I'm having a training on Thursday about it. So we're going to incorporate a new piece of equipment into the lab and it's gonna be pretty fun. Uh, metabolic card is what it's called. And then at the, uh, uh, kind of at the end, how to calculate like kilocalories per minute. Like if, if anybody's ever exercised and you've been interested in how to calculate how many calories you're burning, I'm gonna talk to you about how to do that today. So kind of, kind of like how like the ellipticals and different things like in the gym, how they cal uh, calculate calories. I'm gonna explain how that works. It's really all based off of work overall. So <clears throat> outline units of measure, work and power, I'm gonna define them and do a little bit of math with it. Measurement of work and power on a bench, uh, energy expenditure, and then a couple of other things that uh, may or may not be uh, crazy relevant to the class overall. So here's the first thing, if anybody's following along with your uh, uh, PowerPoint slides, um, just underline things that we need to do. So the metric system, uh, overall, that's kilograms, meters, uh, liters, different things like that. So the system that we typically use is called the British customary system, or as I like to call it uh, frequently, American freedom units, but most of the world doesn't actually use them. That wasn't funny to anybody? Okay, cool, moving on, moving on. Um, <clears throat> so it's just a standard system so that we can compare what we measure here in the States to what people do in say China or England or Germany or Finland or South Africa or wherever. So that's really just overall what the SI system is. Like everyone's heard of this before, right? There's gonna be like a bunch of like quick conversions that I'm gonna want you to remember. And uh, I'm not gonna talk about it just yet. Here in a second I will. Overall, uh, here are the typical prefixes for most of this stuff. In this class, we're mostly gonna be focused around 
kilo to milli. That's most of the things that we're going to do. So like millimeter, centimeter, kilogram. Uh, what I used to do, I actually did a lot of things with like microliters. So if anybody's ever done like a pipette before, so pipettes are typically done in increments of microliters. And in here, we're not really going to do that, mostly just around kilo, centi, and milli. Everyone good with that? So know what those mean. So kilo, 1,000, centi, 100th, uh, milli, 1,000th. Is everyone good with that? On a test or a pop quiz, that could be a question, right? Good with that? OK. Uh, moving on. So important SI units, we need to know all of these. We need to know all of these. So mass, kilogram, everyone knows that. Or gram, that, uh, that's kind of the smaller version of it. Uh, but overall, we're going to be mostly dealing with humans and their body weight and different masses that they move through space and time. So like lifting weights, throwing a shot put, whatever. So that, we're, it's almost always going to be in kilograms. Uh, after that, distance, um, <clears throat> meters will be one of the main distances that we actually deal with. Um, whenever we start working on, we, we might do some circumference measurements on humans and then it will be like centimeters. Uh, we might actually end up doing like some skin fold calipers calculating body fat and that'll actually be in uh, millimeters, but overall meter, that's kind of the thing. Time, seconds, that makes sense. Uh, force, newtons, work is in joules, energy is in joules. Another form of energy that we're going to be talking about that I will want you to know the definition to is calorie. So that's coming up in slides to come. Uh, power is in watts. Velocity is meters per second. And torque, uh, with our ice kinetic dynamometer, we're actually going to be doing a fair bit of stuff with torque. Um, so really, that's just like an angular force, more or less, if you don't know how, like what torque really means. And that's going to be in Newton meters. So moving on from there. All right, first thing to know, and a little bit of math with it, work, the equation for work. Force times distance, force multiplied by, multiplied by distance. So know that. Get it tattooed on your forearm during a test so that you can, you know, just know it, right? So work, this is in joules, right? And force has to be in newtons because that's what the last slide said. Is everyone good with that? That makes sense, right? So we have to convert like American freedom units, pounds, to force in newtons. So kind of how you would do that, write this down, write this down. You have to convert pounds to kilograms first. Does anyone know how to do that? Hmm? Yes, 2.2. So you would divide pounds by 2.2046 if you want to like do it as specific as I like to do it. But 2.2 is perfectly fine. I think you could also just multiply pounds by 4.4, and that would get you in the ballpark. It's not exactly right, but it's pretty close. Um, and then after you get kilograms, you have to multiply by 9.81 to convert kilograms to newtons. So solidify this in your memory. Almost any of the time in lab, whenever people mess stuff up, whenever we're dealing with work or power or work, it's because they left a weight in kilograms or pounds, and they didn't convert it to newtons. So like here, let's take something right here. If we lift a 10 kilogram weight, so already gave it to you in metric, you know, communist units, right? So there we go. If we put it up a distance of two meters, how do we calculate the joules there? So one kg multiplied by 9.81 in, that gives us, 10 multiplied by 9.81, 98.1 newtons. Is everyone good with this math, right? Now, something interesting, if anybody knows like Mike Stebor, he, uh, he actually taught me this. Where do, you, where do you think we got like the number for a newton from? Does anybody know? What like landed on Sir Isaac Newton's head? An apple. So like one newton is approximately the pound, or like, like the weight of an apple. Is that kind of, kind of cool? No? So like, 
10 kilograms is almost 100 apples. No? All right. It's, uh, I didn't talk to anyone this weekend, so that's what I was thinking about. Cool. <laughs> All right. So that's how we do that. Then you multiply by a distance, uh, 2 meters. So 98.1 multiplied by 2, that's 196.2 newton meters. And 1 newton meter is equal to a joule. So we would get 196.2 joules. That is a certain amount of work. Everyone good with this? Good? OK. So if we had problems like this, you could do it, right? So force times distance, just make sure to convert everything to the proper thing. OK, good. Um, a couple of things here. So common units used to express work and energy. One of the main ones that we're actually going to be doing in lab all the time, and it's going to show up on a couple of slides after this, uh, kilopond meter. So this kilopond, it actually, I will frequently say, kilogram meter <coughs> per minute. So what that is is just a certain amount of joules. So one kilopond meter or one kilogram meter is equal to 9.81 joules. So on the next line, the kilocalories, something interesting with this that we're about to like do a little bit of like kind of fancy math with. One calorie, kilocalorie, is equal to 4,186 joules or 4.186 kilojoules. I think that's kind of interesting because we can actually do a lot of fun stuff with it. So here, check this out for, for example. Do you all have this slide? Yes. Yeah? OK, cool, cool. So if you're lifting weights, we could technically figure out how much energy or kilocalories that we're actually burning through a given set. I want you to follow this. Like, well, here first off, before looking at that, who thinks lifting weights burns a lot of calories? A few people? A few people? OK, OK. Like, reasonable to think that. Reasonable to think that. Let's follow some math with it. So let's say 135 pound squat for 10 repetitions. And let's just say one rep is approximately half a meter. Now, I've seen some of you squat. Most people don't squat that deep. But that's OK. That's OK. You should, but that's OK if you don't. How this works. First, you have to convert 135 American Freedom Units to kilograms. So divide by 2.2046 right there. Then we get 61 or so. Then convert that to Newtons, multiply by 9.81 gravity, or the amount of apples that it should be. Like, isn't that kind of cool? 135, it's like 600, 600 apples, right? After Mike told me that, I see the world entirely different. Like, whenever I'm looking at all of you, you're just apples to me now. It's, uh, now are you all Gala or Fuji or what? It, it doesn't really matter. Some pink ladies in here. Um, that was kind of funny. I came up with that, like, right on the spot. All right, okay. That's, uh, okay, so there. If we move it a certain distance, so 10 repetitions, we only calculate vertical distance. Now, this is a little bit off because there is some ATP burned through the eccentric or lowering aspect of the, the movement. So it's a touch off, but it isn't that far off. So 10, so 10 repetitions, 0.5 meters. So that, the 600 apples that you're squatting, and then 10 meters, or 10 repetitions, I'm sorry, by 0.5 meters, that's 3,000 joules, right? Everyone good with that so far? And then you divide it by 4,186, so that equals 0.72 calories. Can anyone in here like squat 135 for 10? Like, why, why isn't everything going up? That's uh, no, I mean, like it's okay if you can't. It's okay if you can't. Uh, like, I, I can barely get out of chairs these days. It seems harder to do than one calorie worth of energy, right? But that's technically all that's going on during that. Now, there, are, there is like muscle damage and like repair of muscle damage. That's really where like most of the calories from uh, lifting weights actually comes from. But overall, it doesn't, like it's not that many calories or energy to lift a weight 10 times or so. Go with that. Is that kind of fascinating to anybody? Right? Okay. I mean, it's fascinating to me, but whatever. And like overall, that's like 0.18 
like carbohydrates are 0 0.08 grams of fat. So if, uh, if you're good with that, like four calories per gram or nine calories per gram if you're interested in things like that. Moving on to the next thing, and I probably need to start going a little bit faster. Uh, power, power. So our main unit that we're gonna be doing this in is watts. So watts is just joules per second. So have this memorized, power, just work over time. Time is almost always going to be seconds and work in joules, force times distance, right? So we're good with that. So if we say that someone performed uh, 20,000 joules worth of work in one minute or 60 seconds, how many watts is this? It is uh, 333 and a third about watts. So whenever we get on like cycle ergometers, it's gonna be really important for us to know what wattage that they're working at. Typically it's gonna be somewhere between like 50 watts and uh, like, yeah, like oh, some people will get up to 500 or so. Okay, so units to uh, use to express power. So watt, that's our main one. Um, horsepower, we're not gonna use that in this class because it's derogatory, so. I mean, like, all of this is planned, right? It's, uh, okay. Um, uh, kilopon meter per minute. Uh, that I referenced a little bit ago. We're going to be converting between watts and kilopon meter uh, per minute quite a bit. So I want you to have this in your head. One watt is equal to cross out the point 12. We're just going to do six. One watt equal to six kilopon meters per minute. And I understand if this is super abstract, whenever we get in the lab tomorrow, it will make a lot more sense. <clears throat> and uh, like converting a kilopon meter per minute to watts, that 0.163, that's just dividing it by six. So it goes either way that way. Like I wouldn't multiply anything by 0.163. So uh, important thing here, uh, I guess I should have done that a little while ago. One thing, I'm mostly going to say kilogram meter per minute. So kgm slash min. That means the exact same thing in this class as kilopond. Is everyone good with that? So the book will frequently be saying kilopond I'm gonna be saying kilogram meter, it's the same thing. Everyone good with that? So don't get confused. Okay, uh, moving on. So here, let's, uh, let's figure out some wattage. Say the, the same situation of like boiling, uh, burning 0.7 calories or whatever. Let's say 135 squat, same thing, but they do it in eight seconds, so moving relatively quickly. So uh, 3,000 some odd joules in eight seconds, that is equal to, you just like do the division, 375.5 give or take watts, and then to convert it to kilogram meters per minute, you multiply by six. Is everyone good with that? So converting it from kilogram meters per minute to watts, you would just divide by six. Everyone good here? Good here. Now, this is a super, like, I, I don't know, like, kind of stupid example. You're not going to be doing anything like this. Um, but with, uh, with bikes, you will be doing a lot of stuff like this. And I'm going to get into some examples with that here in a little bit. Okay. Next couple of things to know about. Uh, measurement of work and power. So within exercise physiology or biomechanics or just exercise science in general, we have to measure things. So like there's probably a lot of like gym culture bro words that people use like intensity. And scientists say it meaning something a little bit different. But before we get to all of that type of stuff, we need to understand like, we need to measure some type of variable to essentially put into graphs or to get an understanding. So overall, that is ergometry or ergometry, however it's said. Right? It's derived from the Latin ergo, which just means work. So the measurement, so metry, meter, measure, work, measure, measurement of work. Is everyone good with that? 
That's the etymology there. Um, ergometer. So we have a couple of different like uh, ergometers or ergometers. I'll probably go back and forth in how I say that. Um, in the lab, probably the two most important ones are the cycle and arm ergometer. So leg cycle ergometer and arm cycle ergometer. We can also do a fair bit of measuring of like workout output on like bench stepping and on treadmills. However, those two we probably won't do that much of uh, for various reasons. Um, now, tomorrow in lab, like one person in your lab group will run up the stairs of the Williams Center like twice and we'll measure your power. Um, but overall, like uh, not too many exercise physiologists use uh, bench step or ergometry in order to measure too many things. So we're not going to get into that too much. And treadmills are a little bit different. We're going to use some different equations. Like, has anyone watched uh, those like YouTube videos yet? Good. No one's a nerd. That's that's awesome. Excellent. Uh, like, we're going to get in some metabolic equations, and that's really going to like work a lot better for the treadmill type of stuff. But here's what all of these li uh, look like, more or less. So, <clears throat> if you watch the videos, like we've got cycle ergometers, arm ergometers, and we've got treadmills in the lab. So that's more or less how it's going to look. Bench stepping, again, not so much. Now here, bench stepping, the only reason that I think many of you would need to know this is if you're ever a coach to numerous individuals or if you're like a physical education teacher or anything like that. The main function of bench stepping, we can figure out someone's like, I don't know, like top like aerobic power capacity and we can get numerous people at once because all you really need is like some bleachers to know like how far it is and to have a calculation of how many steps they're taking per minute and how much they weigh. So that's somewhat easy. Uh, so on here, uh, we have to control it to where individuals step up and down at a specific rate. So frequently like 30 steps per minute would be something like this. So kind of how this works. So say a 70 kilogram individual, so what is that? That's probably around 158 pounds maybe. I don't know, like it's, it's something near that. Uh, 0.3 meters stepping, 30 uh, like steps per minute for 10 minutes. So how all of the math works there, you have to convert 70 kilograms into newtons. So a 70 kilogram person weighs, you know, just under 700 apples. Distance, three meters times 30 steps times 10 minutes, so 90 meters of vertical displacement. And then that gives us a given amount of joules or work. And then for power, you would just divide it by the amount of seconds that it took. So 10 minutes multiplied by 60, right, 600. And then that gives us 103 watts. Does everyone see like how this math works? It's gonna be fairly similar with Cycle ergometry, uh, cycle ergometry, sorry, and um, treadmill just, just a bit. Now this one, if you haven't been paying attention, I would pay attention now, because this we're going to be doing a lot in lab. Cycle ergometry. Now a couple of things with cycle ergometers. One revolution on a cycle ergometer is six meters. And cycle ergometers, the Monarch cycle ergometer, it was made in Sweden, and they just like the number six for whatever reason. So if you don't know that, write that down. Six meters is every single revolution. Important concept for us to know. In lab, I'll be using a metronome. And if you don't have rhythm or like beat in your, in your soul, everyone's going to know, and that's OK because you're going to have to be pedaling on the metronome. And we'll set it to where you're doing 50 revolutions per minute. And it really just makes the math relatively easy for us to do. So if this doesn't make sense yet, it will tomorrow. I've probably said that three times, is that right? <coughs> okay, yeah, I'll try to stop doing that. Um, so here's what we have to do. There, there's two different ways how to calculate work. And really, the main one I want you to know is that second one. Because whenever we talk about cycle ergometers, we're going to be talking in kilogram meters per minute, or uh, uh, yeah, or just kilogram meters. Not frequently is it reported in joules. 
Joules would be more like lifting an object, but on a cycle ergometer, it's almost always kilogram meters. So, watch this. If we have a certain amount of weight on a bike, 1.5 kilograms, so that's essentially just force times distance, right? That's really what all of this is. So 1.5 times 6 times 50 times 10 gets us 4,500 kilogram meters. Does everyone see like how kind of the product or like multiplication of this works? So, okay, okay. I won't like talk about it too much. It, uh, hopefully it does just make sense. Now for calculating power, you will need to know this. Um, <coughs> really, this bottom one right here. So whenever the amount of uh, like the, the total amount of work, you just divide it by the time and that gives us what's called a work rate. So the term work rate really just means what power is being maintained over time. Is everyone good with that? Good. And we can convert this number to watts back and forth if we really want to. And I, uh, I don't know what it is. I'm always like super uncertain of math. Yeah. So these two numbers right here, they're just off by like multiplication or division of six. Is everyone good with that? So like I'm trying to really like beat that into your head right now. So multiply by six from the watts to get the kilogram meters per minute, or divide by six to go from kilogram meters per minute to watts. Everyone good with this so far? Good? Okay. Here's something about treadmills. Treadmills, this isn't generally, uh, the math doesn't really work whenever we derive it from like regression equations. And that's because whenever you're on a treadmill, you're moving your body horizontally and vertically if you have an incline on there. Now, all of the other things, so like a bench step, you're really only moving yourself vertically. And I know it seems like on a cycle that you're moving yourself horizontally, but you're actually pushing down. So you're moving yourself up in a way. Does that make sense to everybody? It's like, it's a little bit abstract, but like it's just through the magic of mechanics and stuff that a vertical uh, displacement is transferred into a horizontal displacement with bikes. So here, something, and I'm just going to kind of read it to you. Uh, cal calculation of work performed while subject runs or walks on a treadmill, not really possible. When the treadmill is only horizontal, so the percent grade is on zero. <clears throat> so what we have to do is actually put a certain percent grade or incline on the treadmill in order to start calculating work. So overall, how this works, and the only reason I'm even talking about this right now is if you go to grad school, and you have a particular professor that's really into this, uh, because I'm never going to have you do this in lab, um, because there's other equations that I think work uh, quite a bit better. So how you figure out like a percent grade, all it is is sine theta, and the theta that just means the like I don't know the degrees of opening right there, or it's just rise divided by hypotenuse. Hopefully everyone remembers trig just a little bit. I'm not going to have you do any of this, so don't worry too much. Now, on this slide, there's one main thing I want you to memorize. One huge thing. Miles per hour, or American freedom units of speed, we have to convert that to meters per minute. So how we do that? One mile per hour is equal to 26.8 meters per minute. So know that. So if you're going three miles per hour, just three multiplied by 26.8, I can't do that in my head because, you know, like I'm in front of a bunch of people and I'm nervous. So it's actually kind of warm in here. I don't think I'm nervous, but maybe I am. Yeah, okay. Moving on, moving on. So here, like say 200 meters per minute, that's around seven and a half miles per hour. So if we follow the math through here, something to note, about percent grades, if you're doing the multiplication with it, it says 7.5% grade. Make sure to always enter that, say, in your calculator or online or like through Excel or whatever, as 0.075. Is everyone good with that? 
Good. So remember that's how percentages work whenever you convert them to decimals. So don't forget that. Uh, I'm not going to talk any more about this uh, because it's, I don't think it's abundantly relevant. So here is a slide y'all don't have. And that's OK. I'm just going to talk about it a little bit. I gave you an Excel file that essentially has a bunch of formulas calculated in it to where using either walking, running, cycling, arm cycling, or stepping, we can calculate how much oxygen someone is consuming or how, much, or how many calories that they're burning. So that's kind of my gift to you in this class if you're ever a trainer or anything like that and you're trying to figure out how many calories someone is burning working at like a particular steady state. Like say if someone's running five miles per hour at, I don't know, for like 30 minutes. The Excel document that I gave you, you could just plug all that stuff in and it would essentially tell you. And we're going to mess with it quite a bit more in lab tomorrow. Uh, so like different people in your group are going to have to burn 50 calories on like an arm ergometer or a cycle ergometer or what have you. So main thing that I wanted to tell you about this first is whenever we're looking at what are called metabolic calculations or metabolic equations, there's three components to them. So what this is actually predicting, VO2, is just the amount of oxygen someone is consuming. That's what VO2 stands for. And it's actually a relative VO2, which we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that in classes to come. But there's a horizontal component, meaning how fast are they displacing themselves horizontally? There's a vertical component, how fast and how high they're displacing themselves vertically. And then there's a resting component. That 3.5 right there, that is how much or how many milliliters of oxygen an individual is consuming per minute uh, at rest, like three milliliters per kilogram body weight per minute. That's what that is. So really from this, the only thing I want you to know is that metabolic equations, we can predict someone's uh, like how much oxygen that they're consuming, which is then related to how many calories that they're burning. I'll show you some math with, math with that here in a little bit. And there's three components to it. So a horizontal, vertical, and resting component. Is everyone good with this so far? Good? I know it's complicated, and right now the class is starting to get boring, but that's OK, because we're getting close to being done. OK, uh, moving on. Uh, just a summary slide right there. Kind of some main things, work power. I want you to know what those are. Uh, moving on. Next, direct and indirect calorimetry. So calorimetry, all that this is, is how many calories are in an object. So like, everyone in here is like eating food before, right? Good, no one photosynthesizes in here? That's good because there's not a lot of sun here in Wisconsin, so like, you'd probably die. Um, uh, but how direct calorimetry works, if you've ever heard of something called a bomb calorimeter, it essentially just measures the amount of heat given off by doing combustion on an object. So I was actually looking on Amazon uh, today. You can actually buy a bomb calorimeter on Amazon, but like it's like a little tiny one like that you could kind of fit a donut in. It costs over $3,000, so I'm not going to buy it. Um, but uh, like there actually are really big calorimeters that you put people in and they cost like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And uh, I've actually never seen one in person. Uh, I think your book shows one. Uh, so overall right here, calorimetry, it's just measurement of heat production and this is indicative of metabolic rate. So if anyone's ever said, I have a fast or slow metabolism, well hell, you can actually measure that. Uh, with like a direct calorimeter and we can measure it indirectly with an indirect calorimeter that I'll talk about soon. So foodstuffs plus oxygen, so oxidation, we get heat lost from it. So heat just lost from cellular work, and then heat lost from ATP hydrolysis, or breakdown of ATP, the energy currency of the body. We'll talk more about that in bioenergetics. So a distinction that I want all of us to understand, whenever you say calorie, you actually mean kilocalorie most of the time unless you're talking about extremely small things. So one kilocalorie, it's notated as K 
C A L, or it's a big C, like a capitalized C. And on the back of nutrition labels, that's what it is. It's a kilocalorie. On, like, say, a 100 calorie snack pack, it's 100 kilocalories. So just know that if you don't. Um, it's equal to 1,000, like, little mini calories. And as we talked before, it's equal to a given amount of joules. So what calorie actually means, that's this definition right here. I want you to write that down if you don't have it. Now, I think a lot of people just know this. Uh, I think it was first, uh, I don't know. If anyone's seen Super Size Me, there's a whole scene in it where they talk about it for a little bit. Morgan Spurlock, right? So. so the energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water through one degree Celsius, right? So uh, one calorie right there. Oh, gosh. Like, uh, yeah, one kilocalorie. Yes. So here, this is what a like calorimeter looks like. You would put a person in it, and there would be fluid around it, and we would measure the amount of like I don't know temperature increase with the person in there for a given period of time. Like that is the most busy way and most accurate way, the gold standard, if you will, of measuring someone's metabolic rate. Now people essentially never do this. Now, through some biochemistry, we can actually calculate someone's metabolic rate through something called indirect calorimetry, and this is what, we're, what we will do in class. So what this is, measurement of oxygen consumption as an estimate of resting metabolic rate. So the byproducts of metabolism are carbon dioxide and water. So we can actually measure relative ratios of oxygen and carbon dioxide, and then do some backwards calculations in order to figure out how many calories someone is burning, and actually also what type of fuel that they're burning, be it like carbohydrates or fats. And we'll get into that with like exercise metabolism. It's called a respiratory exchange ratio. I'm not going to talk about it just yet. And here's another term: uh, open circuit circuit spirometry. So this determines VO2 by measuring the amount of oxygen consumed. So there's a given amount of oxygen like in the air, and then there's a certain amount of oxygen that comes out of your face after you inhale and exhale. So the idea is the difference right there is what was actually consumed by all of the cells of your body, since we're aerobic beings, right? Whew. Was everyone good with this slide? Like I, I didn't put any underlines on it because it was relatively busy. Um, so here, open circuit spirometry, uh, like we're actually going to be doing this in lab, like we're going to put face masks on people and have them like run or cycle until they can't and uh, like we'll derive like aerobic capacity from that. It'll be relatively fun. Uh, here, summary slides, uh, heat production and oxygen consumption. That's, uh, uh, yeah, these two things. These will probably be fill in the blank questions on a test at some point. So direct calorimetry uses the measurement of heat production as an indication of metabolic rate, whereas indirect calorimetry uses oxygen consumption as a measurement of metabolic rate, or as an estimation of metabolic rate. Moving on. A couple of things with O2, or oxygen consumption, that I want to at least start talking to you about now. This is going to be a really large part of the class. If, if you've had me before, I make you memorize the Fick equation a bunch. And it's going to be the same thing in here. But there's essentially two types of VO2 that I want you to be aware of. So one, right here, I want you to write down absolute VO2. So what absolute VO2 is, is the amount of oxygen in liters consumed per minute. And how we figure that out? There's an assumed amount of oxygen like in the atmosphere. It's just under 21%. You know, like most of 
what's like in the air is nitrogen. Hopefully everyone knows that. Um, and then like a, about a fifth of it or so is like actually oxygen. And whenever we exhale, we actually exhale out quite a bit of oxygen. And within like a metabolic heart, we have something called like an O2 sensor, or oxygen sensor. And then we can kind of figure out some things with this. Uh, yeah, that ventilation right there. I'm not going to talk about it until like we actually get to uh, respiratory stuff. So don't worry about that too much. Okay, so with absolute VO2, here's something I want you to <coughs> from someone's absolute VO2, which we can predict a bunch of different ways. So we can do calculations, we can actually measure it, whatever. That is worth a certain amount of calories being burned. So know this, know this. One liter of oxygen per minute is equal to five calories being burned. So if someone is consuming three liters of oxygen per minute, they're burning 15 calories per minute. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm really impressed I did that math in my head right now. Getting kind of tired. Now, that's just the, like, the average. Now, here's something for any of you that are, like, interested in, like, biochemistry, which I am, so hopefully you will be after this class. It actually ranges depending on the substrate or type of fuel that you're burning. So if you know what a macronutrient is, just like fat or carbohydrate or protein, and there is actually a difference in terms of oxygen consumption and how many, like, calories that we actually get from that. So this, I'm not going to test you on, but I, I just want you to like think about this. If you can go back in your mind to like bio 141 or bio 120 or uh, structure and function, wherever you talked about this. <clears throat> if we're deriving our energy from fat, one liter of oxygen gives us 4.7 kilocalories. If we're deriving it from carbohydrate, 5.05. So, which is more efficient? Uh, like, how can we get the most calories with, uh, like, the least oxygen consumption? What do we think here? Carbs, yes, yes. Now, can anyone tell me why? Uh, yeah, that's certainly part of it. So, like, carbohydrate, there's, like, more oxygen in it, give or take. But, uh, uh, like, so, like, C6, H12, or as a fat would be, like, what is it, like, C16, H32, O2, or something like that. Um, so that's an aspect of it. Uh, but, like, another aspect, in order to break down fat, we have to be in the mitochondria. So to get ATP from it, we have to be in the, in the mitochondria. Whereas from carbohydrates, we actually get a fair bit not in the mitochondria. So there, it's a little bit more efficient. So kind of interesting to everybody, right? Cool. So carbs aren't always evil, right? Just most of the time. Uh, all right, moving on from there. Uh, here, we've got a couple more minutes, so I'll talk about this. This VO2 ml per kg per minute. I want you to write down here relative VO2. Relative VO2. So the term relative, does anybody know what the term relative means? Like a brother, sister, cousin? No? It means we're controlling for something. So in the absolute VO2, it was just liters of oxygen per minute. We're not controlling for anything specific to the subject or the individual. Relative VO2, we're actually controlling for how much they weigh. That's where that kg comes in. So write that down if you don't know it. So let's say that a 60 kilogram individual, I think that's 154 pounds, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that's close. If they're consuming 2.4 liters of oxygen per minute, we would get their relative VO2 
by multiplying it by 1,000, so converting the liters to milliliters, and then dividing it by their body weight in kilograms, and that gives us 40. Is everyone good with this? Now, I know I'm throwing a lot of math at you right now. We will practice all of this, so don't feel too terrible yet. Yet. Okay, uh, next thing, just something I wanted you to know really quick. A MET, M-E-T, this is a metabolic equivalent. So frequently exercised physiologists like to talk about metabolic equivalents. So one MET, this is your energy expenditure or oxygen consumption at rest. So one MET, remember a little while ago I was talking about the metabolic equations and the resting component is 3.5? That's where this is coming from. One MET, so all of us at rest right now, except for me, because like I'm actually kind of amped up. You're consuming 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram, so per kilogram of body weight per minute. Everyone good with that? That makes sense? So exercise physiologists will frequently talk about energy expenditure in terms of how many METs, so how many multi, like multiplications of resting that they're actually doing. So if you check this out a little bit, so like watching TV is one MET, so like we're all resting whenever we're watching uh, like The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina or something, which is a pretty good show, I think. Um, and like whenever you're walking three miles per hour, Right there, 3.3 mets. So walking three miles per hour, which I'm probably walking a little bit slower than that because my legs are short. Um, like that's three times resting and so on and so forth. Does everyone like understand that? Good, okay. We probably won't do too much with that. And I'm fairly sure that that is the entire thing.